Hello, and thank you for watching. This is a um, re-record of a paper I gave a couple of weeks ago at the conference Rhythm in Music and the Arts in the Late Middle Ages. Um, obviously, because it's being recorded after the fact, uh, my hair is a couple of weeks uh, longer, um, and there's no discussion at the end. Um, so uh, feel free to get in touch with me. I'd, I'd be glad to hear um, uh, anything that you all may have to say. So, music theory throughout the Middle Ages is premised upon the hard distinction between musica plana and musica mensurabilis, between plain chant and mensural music. A practical treatise may be dedicated to one or to the other, and this is usually stated at the outset. On the other hand, both plain chant and mensural music were developing over time, and developments in one of these spheres could influence the other. The strict divide that theorists posited is convenient and compelling, yet also simplistic. This is particularly clear in the development of notation. As an example, and those of you who know me may find this depressingly predictable, the development of ligatures in menstrual notation is closely connected to the development of multi-note neumes in chant notation. In the De Mensurabili Musica, associated with Johannes de Golandia from the middle of the 13th century, the standard two-note ligature forms were classified as cum proprietate and perfecta, which is later standardized as cum perfectione. A couple of decades later, Franco of Cologne clarifies that this propriety was handed down from plain chant, a plana musica data, Ligatures are with propriety and perfect when they are drawn like the corresponding figures in plain chant, quod sic in plana musica figurator. If we accept what Franco says, then ligatures in menstrual notation were taken straight from the corresponding figures in plain chant notation. But it also goes the other way. In the Introductio Musicae Plane Secunda Magistrum Johannem de Galandia, a treatise on plain chant, there is an odd passage on ligated notes that is closely related to menstrual theory. Quote, it must be known, therefore, that each song is either with words or without words. If it is made with words, it must be notated with simple figures, that is, without words. And if the song proceeds in neumes, then the notes ought to be ligated to each other, however, without loss of the mode. It is certainly unexpected that, as the author suggests, ligatures can cause notes to lose their mode. Surely chant should not have any modal rhythm to begin with. Moreover, the distinction between cum litera and sine litera notation is more common in menstrual theory. It is clear in context and in its reference to noemis, or neumes, that this passage is about chant. Christian Meyer suggests that cum litera refers to syllabic chant and sine litera to melismatic chant, and that amissione could be a corruption of ad missione, so the theorist may be warning against letting chant become rhythmic. Regardless, this theory of chant notation draws on menstrual models. My point is that the obvious awareness of the difference between plain chant and menstrual music has to be tempered by the fact that, at any one point in time, they may have had a good deal in common. This is precisely the dynamic that we see in the Annenberg choir books. These two manuscripts survive today in the Sächsische Landesbibliothek in Dresden under the signatures MS Maz 1D505 and 1D. I will follow the recent edition by Jürgen Kindermann in Das Erbe Deutsche Musik in calling them choir books one and two. Until 1968, they belonged to the Sankt Annenkirche in Annenberg. Wolfgang Steuder suggested they were originally made for Frederick the Wise's electoral court in Saxony around 1520. They traveled to Annenberg before 1539. Using largely paper evidence, Joshua Rifkin cast doubt on any connection to the electoral court and argued that both choir books are older than Steuder believed. 
Choir Book Two from around the first decade of the 16th century, and Choir Book One from around the second. This is also supported by various differences between the choir books and their datable concordances. It remains a possibility that the choir books originated in Unabaric, a city newly founded by Frederick's cousin, George the Bearded. The choir books are practical sources of liturgical polyphony. They contain movements and cycles of the mass ordinary, introits, alleluias, sequences, communions, antiphons, responsories, hymns, monificats, etc. With the exception of the ordinary settings, these liturgical genres are all founded upon the alternation. This alternation follows that of chant practice between cantors and scola. Here is the well-known introit Gaudiamus Omnes in the Junta Gradual from 1499-1500. The double bar lines indicate a change from cantors to scola. The cantors sing the intrepid Gaudiamus, the first half of the verse Erectavit, and the beginning of the doxology Gloria Patri. Here is the same introit found in Annaberg Choir Book 2, out in four separate voices. If we just look at the top voice, you can see it begins with a chant intrabit in square notation before proceeding to the four voice polyphony. The first half of the verse is presented in a Hufnagel or Gothic style chant notation. The doxology is never given in the choir books, but in the absence of a separate collection of Gloria Patris, as in Yena Choir Book 30, they would probably repeat the chant and polyphony of the verse. Finally, the polyphonic sections themselves are always based on a chant cantus firmus or paraphrase. Here the paraphrase is harder to see because it alternates between the top voice and the tenor. So in this example, we see the chant in the intrabit and verse presented self-consciously as chant in direct contrast to the void mensural notation of the polyphonic sections. Both in the visual presentation of the books and in its realization in performance, the distinction between chant and polyphony is omnipresent and foundational. And yet, what these choir books present as chant shares much in common with what they present as polyphony. It too has both polyphonic and rhythmic elements. We can analyze this quote unquote chant notation to understand something about the performance practice of the quote unquote chant it represents. But we should also conceive of the quote unquote polyphony, indeed of these entire genres of liturgical polyphony as an extension of the same practices of chant performance, not something fundamentally different. The distinction between chant and polyphony meant something important, but here, they are two sides of the same coin. As we've already seen, the chant style portions of Choir Book 2 use both black full square notation and Hufnagel notation. The newer Choir Book 1 uses only square notes. Kindermann's edition presents all of these sections in square notes, and it does not try to resolve their stranger. One of these elements, is when two notes are found vertically spaced, one on top of the other, usually towards the end of a phrase. This happens in both types of notation, in both choir books, in the vast majority of intrabits and verses. Kindermann suggests that these double notes are to be performed like a pez or pedatus, singing the notes separately, lower note first. As in the Junta Gradual, a pez in square notation has two notes on top of each other, usually connected with a stem on the right-hand side. Here you can see the, um, the similarity, especially in the Choir Book 1 examples. But the Choir Book 2 example on the top left is missing that stem. And the two vertically spaced notes in the Hufnagel example are nothing like the two different pezes earlier in the verse. The other possibility is that these are simply divisi, two notes sung simultaneously by different singers. To compare, 
The choir books also have numerous examples of Divisi in the polyphonic sections. In choir book two, Divisi is usually found in octaves in the bass at the final cadence, but it is also found in middle and upper voices. Choir book one also has the octaves in the bass, as well as, for example, a fifth in a middle voice and a triple Divisi with the notes spread out horizontally. Common among the vast majority of Divisi in both choir books, in all of these examples here, is the presence of fermatas, one for each divided note. Sometimes the fermatas are in the voice with Divisi, but not in all of the other voices. The fermatas are not necessary, except to make it abundantly clear that this is Divisi, not one note sung after the other. The fermatas are also a common feature among these vertically spaced notes in the quote unquote chant sections in both choir book two and choir book one. Interpreting these as two held notes, one after the other, makes the phrases unexpectedly long. But more importantly, it doesn't align with chant practice. Wherever these double notes occur, one of them is superfluous to the monophonic melody. If you interpret the double notes as divisi, the verse eructavit from the introit gadayamus has precisely the same number of horizontal notes per syllable as the verse in the introit gadayamus. If they are sung one after the other, the final two syllables have three back-to-back -back notes each. This is not a valid variant. So in short, everything points to these being divisi. Divisi on the penultimate and or final notes of a chant phrase is actually found in numerous sources of liturgical polyphony from German speaking areas. They are found throughout the South German sources for Frederick the Wise, Jena 30 and 33, as well as the related choir, uh, choir book Weimar A. Slightly later Wittenberg sources for Frederick, Jena 34 and 35 have the same divisi, but now in the tenor in Hufnagel notation. There is one example in Munich 3154, the relevant fascicle dates from around 1500. It also occurs in the much later part books like 49. I would be glad to hear of any other examples. As far as I'm aware, this widespread practice has not been mentioned by anyone. I have not found this divisi in any chant sources, but I'm also not sure we should expect to see it in chant sources. Indeed, I'm inclined to think that polyphonic sources of this sort are just as likely to provide insight into contemporary chant performance practice as monophonic sources including those traditionally associated with so-called cantus fractus. Here, at least, we see a very simple sort of chant elaboration popping up all over German-speaking lands around 1500 and lasting into the mid-16th century. Outside of the ordinary settings, all of the liturgical polyphony in the Annaberg choir books, as is standard until the end of the 16th century, is based on the monophonic chants of the same liturgical function. In the Annaberg choir books, the chant melodies are often presented in a way that is visually representative of chant notation. The most obvious way that this happens is through proportional modification. In these cases, three of the voices have the standard mensuration sign cut C, but the chant bearing voice has the sign cut C2. The effect of this is that the chant melody is presented in breves instead of semi-breves. It thus looks closer to what it would have looked like in chant square notation. In this Alleluia O Beate Roque in choir book two, the chant melody stands out in the voice on the top left. The two to one proportion is by no means necessary. The top voice could have been notated in semi-breves in cut C, but then the visual difference would have been less pronounced. The chant melody stands out visually much more than it does orally. The voices are actually moving at similar speeds. 
With the chant imitated in the opening of each voice, it is not immediately apparent to the listener which voice is the actual cantus firmus. This notational device is especially common in sequences as in Concetto Parili in Choir Book One, but it also occurs in other genres such as Introit, another Gaudiamus, following the intonations with Divisi. Other sources of liturgical polyphony present chant cantus firmi in even more explicit visual fashions. In Jena 34 and 35, entire tenor melodies are presented in hoof libel notation. The tenor intribit has the standard divisi, but the hoofnagel notation continues with each note equivalent to a semibreve in the other voices. By contrast, the Anneberg examples remain unambiguously mensural, but both demonstrate the same principle, chant melodies in polyphony being presented to look like chant. When does chant notation become mensural? In most of the intonations in square notation, if you sing them following the rules of ligatures in menstrual notation, each note is equivalent in length, at least until you get to the fermatas. It is hard to tell if these intonations are unmeasured or if they are intentionally equally measured. May be a meaningless distinction if chant is sung with notes of length. Nevertheless, these ligatures are orthographically much more like ligatures in polyphony than like joint notes in chant sources. All of these ligatures are cum proprietate, but sine perfectione, without the perfection of the standard multi-note nooms. For what it's worth, in Anneberg, um, the mensuration sign usually precedes the intonation, as in all of these examples. Going a step further, this Alleluia and verse intonation both have a square note with a stem as the second note, taking the place of a bipunctum. This would sound the same as the response of the second gradual, but the notation is now more explicitly measured. Another example. In a couple of cases in Choir Book 1, inchibits are written in black full semibreves with ligatures cum opposite proprietate. Actually, in the second half of the inchibit above, the scribe reverted to breves halfway through. I don't think the notes in the second half should be sung twice as long as those in the first half. But the semibreve notation is, again, more explicitly mensural, even if, again, the notation is only in A fuller synthesis of chant and polyphony comes in a handful of alleluias, six in choir book two and three in choir book one. I have not found any similar examples in other sources. In these alleluias, the intonation in chant style notation continues straight into the polyphony that follows. Zooming in, you can see the intonation in black full notation, followed by the final group of notes in void menstrual notation. There is no break between the two. The remaining voices begin with rests, counted from the beginning of the intonation. They start singing halfway through the final black full note in the top voice, signum congruentiae, which here is admittedly slightly hard to see. Breathe with coloration in the intonation is equal to a semi breathe in the other voices, the same two to one proportional relationship that we saw in the chant cantus firmi. I think this temporal relationship is implicit between the intonations and polyphonic sections throughout the choir books. A standard note of chant, whether in hoofnagel notation or black full breathes, or even black full semi breathes is equal to a void semibreve in cut C. The edition presents the opening of the Alleluia like this, which, if anything, understates the rhythmic aspect of the intonation. From a modern score, you can sing the intonation however you want to, and the other voices can enter when you've reached the relevant note. 
But from the original, the intonation had to be sung with rhythmic precision, and the other voices had to be counting along for their rests. In this Alleluia in Choir Book One, the intonation continues in black full notation with the same two to one uh, diminution. It also has the standard divisi, now in a fully mensural polyphonic. If you look through any practical manuscript of liturgical polyphony, such as the Annabelle choir books, you are likely to find notational features that both highlight as well as blur the distinction between chant and polyphony. Chant style notation can be found in both monophonic and polyphonic contexts with or without explicit rhythm. This is only a paradox if we consider the history of chant as something separate and independent from the history of polyphony. Sources like these bring the two together and reveal that their relationship is messier than theorists wanted to admit. Implicit in this is the role of the improvisation. On the one hand, this need not be exaggerated. The sources themselves point to a tradition that was written down and sung from the notation. If the choir books were indeed intended for Anneberg shortly after its foundation, it may have been easier to build a musical chapel from scratch using simple notated polyphony, rather than waiting for singers to master a tradition of polyphonic improvisation. But the divisi and simple rhythms probably tell us something about how the same singers would have approached an unmeasured monophonic chant source. And the choir books as a whole may also represent a codified, perhaps more refined version of the traditions of improvised liturgical music that preceded them. These traditions, we may safely assume, involve chant and polyphony existing side by side in opposition to each other yet mutually enriching their continued development. So um, that's the paper. I, I just wanted to mention that there were a couple of comments um, after I gave this uh, paper at the, at the conference. Um, so I wanted to mention two of them. Um, the first was from Professor Marco Gozzi, um, who said that he believed that the, what I was calling divisi were probably single notes, um, that is to say, a visual elaboration of a single note. Um, I uh, hadn't discussed this as it was so self-evident to me looking through, um, being relatively familiar with these manuscripts, that it can't be that in these sources. Um, and as one sort of obvious example, um, here you have the divisi in the top voice on the top left, um, where you have an E and a G, um, and that's above a, a C in the bass, a C in the tenor, and an E in the contra. Uh, that's a, that's a C chord. Um, so if you follow the interpretation that this is a visual elaboration um, and that these two, two notes on top of each other would just be a single F, well, it doesn't work in the har harmonic context. Um, so, uh, but that's not to say that these things uh, don't exist. Similar visually looking things don't exist. Um, that are precisely as Professor Gotzi says. Um, I guess I'm thinking of, of some of the, the long end notes in something like the Eaton Choir book. Um, and finally, the second point um, is that Barbara Hogg um, mentioned that she found a, a similar example of Divisi in uh, a Cambrai manuscript. Um, she followed up with this and uh, showed me this in Choir book, uh, in, in Cambrai 12. Um, which is a source from around 1540. Um, and it's, it's, again, a monophonic source. So you see this um, in this particular example, what looks like Divisi. Um, in that case, I'm actually less certain um, that it is Divisi. And it could be precisely what Professor Gotzi was suggesting, a visual elaboration. But in the monophonic context, there is less proof either way. Um, thank you for your time. And I look forward to hearing from you.